Welcome to You Are From God, where we open the Bible and learn to see the image of God in ourselves and the people around us. I'm Scott Taylor. And I'm Tyler Hall. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks for tuning in. We are really excited to be back with you, to spend a few minutes opening God's Word and seeing how we are all from God. Today is going to be a bit of a continuation of our last episode. If you were able to catch that one, last time we talked about the idea of having all things in common, thinking about ourselves, how we identify ourselves and see ourselves in the light of God's truth rather than worldly things, and whether we're focused on building walls toward other people or if we're seeking to build those bridges in Christ. Today, Scott, we want to carry that idea forward a little bit and really think about the role that Jesus plays in bringing us together and the understanding that he makes this level ground. You know, I heard a quote here recently, um, and it's just this idea that at the foot of the cross is level ground. When we realize our deep need that we are spiritually bankrupt outside of God and that we are all there Everybody needs Jesus in the same way, no matter what we're coming from, no matter what resources we have or what different path life has taken us down to this point. The cross is the great equalizer. It makes us realize that, again, we all bear God's image. We have all sinned and fallen short of that glory of God and that we can have that image restored in us and walk in that image when we come to the Lord through Jesus. And I love the idea of how Jesus talks about this process is something that requires our faith. In Matthew chapter 17, I go back to this because I think there's a lot of application. After Jesus is transfigured up on a mountain, he comes down off of the mountain. His disciples have struggled getting this demon out of this young boy, and Jesus goes up to him and he heals him instantly by rebuking the demon. In Matthew 17, picking up in verse 19, the disciples came to Jesus privately and said, why could we not cast it out? In verse 20, he said to them, Because of your little faith, for truly I say to you, if you have faith like a grain of mustard seed, you will say to this mountain, Move from here to there, and it will move, and nothing will be impossible for you. We would love to have that idea when it comes to construction, like literally moving mountains uh, to build roads or what have you. We understand that that takes a lot of time and effort and energy And we're not talking about physical mountains here, Scott. These are the mountains that require our faith to move them. But putting our faith and trust that God is able to move those mountains is where we really want to focus and spend our time. And so understanding that the cross is what gives us this level ground and whatever mountains might separate us in the worldly sense, Jesus is the one that takes them out of the way. And there's a story in the New Testament that really captures this powerfully, I think. I think. There's not a better story that that describes this in the book of Philemon. It's a very short book, but the story as to what you just um, laid out is really what this is founded upon. You have a man who, from a human perspective, had every right to be mad at this other guy. And because he was a child of God, you have a different reaction that was going to be expected. And so you open this story, and there's this man by the name of Philemon, and Philemon he was a member of the uh, church in Colossae, so much so in Colossians it talks it tells us that they met in his house. And so you have a man who was very uh, much a child of God living the life, and he owned um, slaves. And so he had one slave that worked for him uh, by the name of Onesimus, and Onesimus runs away. And so when you think about that perspective, right, all, right off the bat, you understand that there's some issues that are starting. And, and so when Onesimus runs away, he gets to Rome, And him and Paul find each other. Um, They become (laughs) in the same prison, it seems. And so you have these two that are that are there and and Onesimus obeys the gospel. And so he's going to send him back to um, Philemon. And the danger at this point, Tyler, is how is Philemon going to accept him? How is he going to react to this one who has left him? And and so you have this conversation that goes on. It begins really talking about um, the love and the faith of Philemon that Paul knew that he had and and understood that he was going to accept him back. And so in verse 10, you pick up and it says, I appeal to you for my son Onesimus, whom I fathered in my imprisonment, who previously was useless to you, but now is both useful to you and to me. Now, it's worth noting his name, uh, Onesimus, means useful. And so it's the play on his name here when he says he was useless and now he's useful both to me and to you. And so he sent him back. And so, Tyler, the interesting part of this conversation right off the bat is that 
Onesimus was willing to go back. Mm-hmm. You have Paul and his perspective of the heart of Philemon and how he was going to receive him back. But you also see the heart of Philemon and the choice that Philemon has to make now. Am I going to accept him back not as a servant, but as a brother? And the understanding of the change that occurs here, that now we are brothers in Christ. Uh, verse 16, if you continue on here, starting verse 15. For perhaps it was for this reason that he was separated from you for a while, that you would have him back forever, no longer as a slave, but more than a slave, a beloved brother, especially to me. But how much more to you, both in the flesh and in the Lord. What an amazing passage this is. Until you actually realize what was going on in reality and the choice that now Philemon has to make. And why I say it that way is that there are times in our lives where things occur and we have to choose whether or not I'm really willing to treat somebody else as a brother or sister in Christ as they are. Or am I going to allow pride or being hurt or whatever the case may be influence the way that I treat other people or accept other people that, that come back. And that's in real time can be a very difficult thing. We read this beautiful story and Philemon had the same choice that he had to make. And so it's viewing people on the same ground. Was there something that Onesimus did to Philemon? Absolutely. Was he back now? Yes. Was he able to be accepted back just as a servant? He could have been. He also could have been punished. There's a lot of things he could have done. But the bottom line is that Paul was desirous and God is desirous of Philemon in that case and us as well to accept him as a brother or sister in Christ. It's understanding the level ground that we all are on and and understanding the different roles and the different things that we can allow to divide us. But more importantly, what actually brings us together. I think that's a, a powerful case study, too, just as an aside on what repentance looks like for Onesimus you know, obeying the gospel, he says, well, I ran away from that old life, and I'm going to, from here on out, I'm going to pursue Christ. But real repentance, when it comes to that, means making right what you can, as far as it depends on you, and it's in your power. And Paul sends him back, because this is what's right. And so it's an illustration of repenting, uh, the bearing the fruits of repentance, that it is a great risk for Onesimus to go back, because you know, you don't know how Philemon's going to receive him, but it's the right thing to do. And trusting that God is at work in this situation is really key to all this. So you think about our imagery that we're using, this idea of mountain moving faith that Jesus talked about in Matthew 17. Just this little bit of faith can do a whole lot when you put your heart and your trust and act in obedience with God. And then the idea that the cross is where we find this level ground. Once those mountains are moved out of the way, there's this unity, there's this peace, this connection to God and to each other. So what are these mountains that are in the way between Onesimus and Philemon in this short little letter? Well, certainly you have different roles. We already talked about Philemon is a master and Onesimus is a slave or a bond servant. It's worth noting that this was pretty common. It normally would have come about as Onesimus owing a debt. And so this is a relationship, again, that uh, makes it pretty clear here. They're brothers in flesh, uh, and so it would have been a Jew serving a Jew. And this idea that... um, this is how he's paying off his debt, his, this working arrangement. It's not quite an employer-employee exactly apples to apples, but they are different roles, and they are responsible in fulfilling those roles, Onesimus in particular, serving Philemon in this capacity. So there's already that difference there. Certainly that would have led to differences economically. You know, Philemon had the ability to serve the church and bring them into his home, and Onesimus is running away. He was in this role of servitude for probably economic reasons, and so there's wealth at play here. The relational tension that comes from betraying this arrangement and running away and now coming back. There's this leaving aspect of betrayal and abandonment that can all kind of play into what how they would have viewed each other. Uh, and we get no reason to believe that Philemon was anything but a kind master from how Paul describes him in this letter. And then you get just the baggage from past hurts. Okay, you can say Onesimus is coming back. He is a new person. He's new in Christ. Now he's a brother, not just in the flesh, but in the Lord. That doesn't just take away the memories of, well, we were really struggling when you left, or, you know, we had to pick up the slack here, and, you know, it really hurt us when you did this. And so all of these different mountains, how can I get past this? How can I forgive this person? How can I go back to this guy when I've already done so much wrong from each person's perspective? All of those mountains come out of the way 
when it's in Christ. When it, when it comes down to seeing each other, again, as image bearers of God and as united in the Lord Jesus. I think verse 16 is so powerful. He's not just a slave. He's more than that. He is a beloved brother. This idea of being in the Lord is just so powerful to understand how Onesimus could now view his master, Philemon, and how Philemon was certainly had the choice in viewing Onesimus. And just this idea that these men had a lot of things that were different about them, but they found level ground when the mountains were moved in Jesus Christ. And they were the same. They were all one in Christ. And so powerful to the point that you're just making in Galatians, the third chapter, the actual words of our Savior uh, through Paul saying that exact same thing. Um, verse 27, we'll start in verse 26. For you are all sons and daughters of God through faith in Christ Jesus. For all of you who were baptized into Christ, have clothed yourself with Christ. There is neither Jew nor Greek. There is neither slave nor free. There is neither male nor female. For you are all one in Christ Jesus. It can't be said any simpler than that, Tyler. It's, it's amazing how if we actually live those verses, how much... Um, division would be stopped. There wouldn't be so much friction amongst people and and the dividing things. I mean, First Corinthians is written because of all the division that was going on in Corinth, and some of that has to do with the things that we're talking about, the wealthy compared to the poor and how we view other people, all the different aspects that we can get caught up in. To the point in First Corinthians 6, Paul asks a question about the an issue that was going on, and he says, why not just be wronged? Well, that's a different perspective than the normal human perspective that you're going to have. I don't want to be wronged is why. But Paul says there's bigger things at play than you being wronged or having something that has occurred to you in the past. It doesn't take it away. What it does is that we look at each other in a different perspective through the lens of Jesus Christ. And if we have that idea and that perspective, things absolutely change. And that's what I think is so powerful and a lot of the different uh, books that Paul writes, he'll, he'll tell us we need to forgive one another. You need to get rid of the bitterness. You need to get rid of all these things that are hard to get rid of. Why? Because Jesus Christ forgave you. And if that's the prism in which we look at everything, it's amazing the difference of the burdens that we are willing to put down and, and stop allowing things to divide us rather than just continuing to go. And to your point, you don't forgive them. It's not like you, you know, your memory's washed or anything like that, but you're able to view them in the light of Jesus. And that's looking at each other as brothers and sisters or sons and daughters of God. And if we can have that perspective, it just seems like the selfishness and the peace is so much easier to, 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 to get rid of the selfishness, but then to have the peace that comes with still differences of people, but all united in Christ. And that's really important when it comes to not just looking at relationships now and uh, maybe dealing with past hurts, but, but pursuing a path forward and how we interact with new people that come across our paths. Really, one of the key ideas here that God um, demonstrates for us is this idea of being no respecter or of persons or favor of persons. The book of Romans describes him this way. Uh, but really, James 2 uh, makes it clear that we are supposed to have that attitude like God does. He says in chapter 2 and verse 1, My brothers, show no partiality as you hold the faith in our Lord Jesus Christ, the Lord of glory. And then he goes on and gives this example. He talks about somebody comes in and wears a really gold ring and fine clothing. They're coming into your assembly, so they're gathered together as the church. And then somebody else comes in that's a poor man in shabby clothing. You start treating them differently. You start showing honor and respect and uh, being really nice to the person in the wealthy clothes, and then the person who looks a little rugged, you say, you know, you go in the corner or sit at my feet. Verse 4 is the key. Have you not then made distinctions among yourselves and become judges with evil thoughts? God makes it really clear that this is not how we're supposed to be viewing each other. Again, there is level ground at the foot of the cross, regardless of what background you're coming from, and even just the way people look and how they're dressed in this illustration that James uses can automatically set our minds firing with how we are different or, or favoring one over the other. And he says, we cannot have that kind of partiality in the body of Christ. In verse 8, he goes on to say, if you really fulfill the royal law according to scripture, you shall love your neighbor as yourself, you are doing well. But if you show partiality, you are committing sin and are convicted by the law as transgressors. 
it's just so powerful to me that just by favoring one person over the other or having this bias of one type of person or this category of individual is superior or inferior to another, certainly that same sort of temptation could have been there for Philemon and Onesimus. But the beauty of coming together in Jesus, this royal law that James talks about, this law of liberty he goes on and talks about in verse 12 of this same chapter, this is the law that governs us and it calls us to see the mountain-moving power of our faith, that those things that would have divided us and feel like we're miles and miles away from each other are nothing compared to the faith that unites us in Jesus. And in Jesus, those mountains can be moved and that we can come together and have all things in common, as we talked about recently, and the great power of knowing that you and I are from God. Thanks for listening. Show your support by leaving a review on your podcast app and share this episode with someone you want to encourage. If you have questions or would like to get in touch with us, go to youarefromgod.com. That's youarefromgod.com.